Good evening, everyone. I'm Lori Mertes, Executive Director of Locus Projects, welcoming you to Talks, presented in partnership with Ulay Arts. It's hard to believe that this is the last Talks of this season in our series of bringing world-class curators to speak about their practice. Tonight's speaker, Rujeko Hockley, Assistant Curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, is our 27th speaker since we kicked off our partnership with Ulay Arts in 2018. And that's pretty amazing. Um, before I bring Rojeko on, I want to remind everyone, there's going to be a Q&A. This is your chance to ask questions. It's going to be moderated by the incomparable Esther Park, VP of Programs at Ulite Arts. So please be sure to share your questions with us in the chat and let us know where in the world you're watching from. If you've been reading any art magazines or any art sections in national newspapers lately, you will know that Rojeko Hockley is the co-curator of the current much praised Julie Mayret to traveling retrospective, retrospective that opened at the Whitney earlier this month. I had the chance to see it last February at LACMA before the shutdown. And while travel is still a challenge, there's also an incredible catalog and wonderful online talks on the show I super highly recommend. It's really, if you can't see the show in person, try to check it out. Rejeco's other projects at the Whitney include an exhibition featuring Toyen Oji Oduloto, and an incomplete history of protest, selections from the Whitney's collection, 1940 to 2017. And she was also the co-curator of the 2019 Whitney Biennial featuring uh, 75 artists and collectives. You'll hear more about some of these shows tonight, as well as Rejeka's work as assistant curator at the Brooklyn Museum, where she co-curated We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965-1985, as well as working on exhibitions highlighting artists such as LaToya Ruby Frazier, the Bruce High Quality Foundation, Kenda Wiley, and others. She also, in some kind of managing way to, with her spare time, is on the board of Art Matters and Recess, which are organizations deeply dedicated to supporting artists and their practice. And so, without further ado, we've got so much to look forward to and hear about. Let's get to it. Please join me in welcoming Rujeko Hockley. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, and thank you all for being here. here. Um, and thank you to Ulight and to Locust Projects for inviting me. Um, I'm a very esteemed company, um, 27. And I know so many of my peers have also done these talks and I'm really honored to be a part of this. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm sorry that I can't yet be in Miami. I was really looking forward to the beat, but hopefully you'll invite me again and we'll do it that way next time. Um, so today I'm gonna be going over, yeah, many of the exhibitions that Lori just mentioned in that very generous introduction um, and kind of talking a little bit about kind of a bigger picture way that I think about the work that I do as a curator. Um, my presentation is probably way larger than is appropriate for the time allotted. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, so I will also kind of move quickly through some portions, um, but please stay tuned and stay for the Q&A with me and Esther, which I'm sure will be amazing because Esther is amazing. And yeah, let's get started. Andrew, if you want to put the slides up. Amazing. <laughs> Magic. Thank you so much. So as Lori mentioned, one of the shows that I worked on at the Brooklyn Museum, the last show that I worked on, We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965 to 85, um, is a show that I curated with Catherine Morris. Um, and it's a show that continues to be really close to my heart. Um, for many reasons, it built on a lot of work that I did in graduate school at the UC, UC San Diego and just a lot of kind of my, my heart work, I guess. Um, the things that I hold really close to me that I have always kind of held close to me. So this is a quote that we ended the exhibition with actually. Um, and I wanted to start here because in looking through various many presentations I've done over the years, it really struck me that this is kind of a profound statement that actually cuts across for me so much of the work that I do. Um, so I'm gonna read it out loud. We believe that the most profound and potentially the most radical politics come directly out of our own identity, as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. In the case of Black women, this is a particularly repugnant, dangerous, threatening, and therefore revolutionary concept, because it is obvious from looking at all the political movements that have preceded us that anyone is considered more worthy of liberation than ourselves. 
We reject pedestals, queenhood, and walking 10 paces behind. To be recognized as human, lovely human is enough. And this is a quote taken from the Kambahi River Collective's Black Feminist Statement, which they wrote in April 1977. Um, and they were a Black lesbian feminist collective um, founded in Boston in the 1970s. Kambahi River is where Harriet Tubman's successful raid occurred, the only military um, campaign planned and executed by Black women in American history to this day. Um, and I just feel like for me, it crystallizes so much of what I'm thinking about in my work, but also in myself, it's kind of to all of us in some ways. Let's see. So I want us to start with this image of the artists in freestyle, which if you're not familiar, is a very important exhibition that happened at the Studio Museum in 2001. Um, 2001 was my first year of college. I was an undergraduate at Columbia. I studied art history. I did not see this exhibition. I did not know about this exhibition. I learned about it several years later um, as I began to study art history. Um, and actually after that, as I began to realize that art history could be contemporary and that artists actually existed in our contemporary moment, not just in the past. This took me until <laughs> my senior year of college to really figure out, um, which is you know, a longer conversation about how art history is taught. Um, but I wanted to start here because Again, in preparing for this presentation, I realized there are so many kind of overlapping circles and concentric circles and Venn diagrams in my life. Um, and the Studio Museum has really been at the center um, of so many of them. And so I love this photograph because there are so many artists that I've continued to admire, to work with, um, to be lucky enough to call my friends. Um, Here's Julie Marisu right here in the front, but we also have Rasheed Johnson, Sanford Biggers, Corey Newkirk, Carolyn Harris, um, Layla Ali, Nadine Robinson, Adia Millet, uh, Mark Bradford, Rico Gatson, Clifford Owens. Um, let's see who else. And other people that I'm not gonna go through all their names, but many people that have continued to have flourishing careers and people that, you know, at the time I would never have imagined that I would ever work with. Um, so first of all, you never know what your future holds um, at all. The first exhibition that I ever worked on in my life actually was in the very same galleries and it was the second so-called F exhibition, Frequency. Um, and this is a show that opened at the Studio Museum in November of 2005. I began working there in the summer of 2005, soon after graduating um, from Columbia. And it's the first exhibition of any kind I ever worked on. I was a curatorial assistant um, and the Studio Museum has a very small staff then as now. And one of the perks of that sort of arrangement is that you learn everything and you participate in everything and you do everything. So we installed, we put together the checklist. This is a show that was curated by Thelma Golden and Christine Y. Kim. Um, and I was kind of part of this team very luckily. And so I also wanted to bring these images here because the Studio Museum is of course about to build an amazing new building, which I'm thrilled about, but also this old building and these old kind of funky galleries will always kind of hold a special place in my heart. And I'm sure the hearts of maybe, maybe not the artists because there were some issues, the staff. In between the Studio Museum and the Brooklyn Museum, I went, I lived in Southeast Asia. I taught English. I was a temp at various like financial firms and law firms in New York City. I applied to graduate school and I went to graduate school in San Diego. Um, and then I came back to New York. <laughs> so I did a bunch of stuff. And then I was hired at the Brooklyn Museum as an assistant curator. And the first exhibition I worked on was Latoya Ruby Frazier's A Haunted Capital. Um, and I'm thinking about these exhibitions now kind of all in this context of this, this Kambahi River Collective quote around to be lovely human is enough. Um, and that that is, is the goal, that is the desire. Um, so Latoya was a really incredible exhibition to work on. I'm going to move kind of quickly through these exhibitions at the Brooklyn Museum, but I wanted to also just share the images because 2013 is both, you know, eons away, but also not that long ago, but we don't always get to see these things in the past. Um, the Rusai Quality Foundation, Ode to Joy, another exhibition that I worked on, a very different kind of artwork and also a very different kind of group of artists, a collective, um, which I think served me really well in that I've continued to work in collective in some capacity. I've often collaborated 
curatorially. Um, I've worked on many group exhibitions. Um, and actually, I think working with the Bruce High Quality folks was an interesting kind of introduction to that very expansive kind of proliferating ideas way of working. Crossing Brooklyn, Art from Bushwick, bed and Beyond is an exhibition. I would say it's the first exhibition that I felt like really had like my kind of print on it. I co-curated it with Eugenie Tsai um, and was very honored to work with her, but also really to be able to work with a really incredible group of artists was my first experience in a kind of large scale thematic group exhibition um, in all of its glory. And so we're looking at David Horvitz, really beautiful project um, with the bells in the foreground and Paul Ramirez Jonas with his core course in the background, Chantel Martin on the right side. Um, and Miguel Luciano's flags are kind of flying at the top, his kites, which unfortunately you cannot see. But this was an exhibition that was really thinking about how do we think about artists whose practice kind of exceed the bounds of the studio? And this is, again, when I look at the arc of what I've kind of done since 2005, I guess, um, I see kind of some threads of continuity and this is really one of them, this interest in artists um, and in kind of art practices that exceed the bounds of the traditional kind of white box of the gallery or of the studio. And that actually is not a medium specific approach. It's not like, oh, painters don't do that, but, you know, people working in performance do. I think actually many artists in all media can have that. So Crossing Brooklyn was an exhibition that really was trying to think literally about artists outside the studio. So we had artists working kind of literally in the <laughs> waterways of New York City, Marie Laurence, um, on the left. Um, we had artists kind of working in collaboration with the public, um, kind of working in dialogue with the public. Um, we had kind of renderings for projects that were actually never realized. So on the bottom is Linda Good Bryant and Project Eats Garden that never looked like that. It actually ended up happening here on the side of the building and was there for many years. And so in addition to the kind of cyclical nature of um, Studio Museum, there's also kind of cycles and artists who have recurred. And Linda Good Bryant is someone who I've been kind of basically in awe of for many, many years before I ever met her and have been very lucky to be able to work with her in different capacities. Um, but this show was the first time I worked with her kind of officially and we were able to build a terraced garden on the side of the Brooklyn Museum and host a weekly farmer's market. Um, Project Eats, if you're not familiar, is a really incredible organization that she founded, um, which runs, creates and runs community farms in underserved communities in New York City, um, East New York, Brownsville, um, et cetera. Linda thinks of this as an artwork, of an, as an art project, and as an extension of work that she did um, in the 1970s, founding a gallery called Just Above Midtown. So she's a really incredible person, if you haven't. She will be having a show at MoMA in 2022, I want to say, maybe 23. So, you know, watch that space. Um, Kehinde Wiley, um, a very different sort of artist, very different sort of um, exhibition, but again, a really incredible opportunity. Kehinde is somebody who also connects back to the Studio Museum for me, who I met first in those galleries um, at an opening, you know, some opening or the other. And so again, these cycles and the ways in which these kind of shared interests continue to proliferate. Um, a reminder just of how beautiful that show was, um, which traveled all over the country. Um, I think that's been a really interesting aspect of my work as well is exhibitions that you plan for one location, then having a life that really exceeds that location, that time, you know, the Kehinde's show was on the road for years. I mean, it felt like it was like five years. It probably wasn't, but it was on the show on the road for at least three years, which is a very long time. Um, and a lot can change in three years, as we obviously know, having lived through a very, a year in which massive things have changed. But, you know, this is always true on some level. So, but to be able to create something that then lives in this different way, I think is also really important. I've worked most of my career in, um, and at New York, you know, New York institutions, but I'm very interested and very committed to thinking beyond the coasts and also thinking beyond New York. And one of the ways that I think we can do that as curators most effectively is thinking about how our shows travel is being really like conscientious about who our partners are trying to get our shows to other institutions, trying to kind of not just really kind of myopic, myopically focus on our own audiences and our own cities. 
Um, this is a show that I just included because I just really loved it. It was like a small little show that paired Kara Walker's African boy attendant that was one of the figures that was included in her project, her creative time project at the Domino Sugar Factory with objects from our decorative arts collection at the Brooklyn Museum that pertain to the sugar trade and to the transatlantic slave trade specifically. And so I think that was one of the really incredible things about working at a encyclopedic museum and having colleagues like the great Barry Harwood, um, who is now deceased, but was an incredible resource, decorative arts curator, um, a person who on my first day of the Brooklyn Museum gave me a tour of all the, the all of the period rooms and we, you know, like inside the period rooms, like took the, the rope down, walked inside, told me about the history of these rooms um, and really knew the collection really inside and out and was an incredible partner actually in thinking about how these objects could tell different stories. Um, decorative arts has not traditionally been a, a discipline or an area of art history that has been really kind of open to rethinking history and thinking about the kind of stories these objects can tell, which may be not always the stories that, that have been desired, as in why do, you know, they haven't always wanted to talk about how slavery connects to a, a tea set. Um, for example, or to, you know, a sugar bowl or all of these different kind of objects that are associated with the field. And so that was a really interesting experience for me. And I really have to have shout out Barry for his willingness to have the conversations and to really be a partner in shifting the conversations around objects that he had been kind of a steward of for many, many years. And then finally at the Brooklyn Museum, I worked on We Wanted a Revolution, as I mentioned. Um, and this is a show that also had a really interesting and long life. It had, it toured to multiple venues. Um, we did two catalogs, which continue to live in the world really amazingly. Um, and, you know, the hashtag proliferates still, which I think is amazing um, in these days of social media. Um, and we opened with this incredible painting by Faith Ringgold on the left for the women's house and this incredible sculpture passenger in the center of the room. Um, and I love to think about the impact of the show, both in the ways that, you know, audiences were impacted, um, the galleries were always full. As I mentioned, it traveled, it was on social media, it had these two catalogs, but also in really tangible ways, there were real and have been and continue to be real impacts on the lives of artists. Um, and I think that is another thing that I've always, I learned at the Studio Museum actually is, you know, we are here as curators in service of artists um, and in service can mean many different things. But I think one of the things it does mean is <laughs> creating a, you know, sustainable financial network foundation for an artist. Um, so someone like Marin, this is this work leaning in 1979, a really beautiful installation image. Um, the work had only been seen, I believe twice in its history. Um, it was in a very important show called Afro-American Abstraction at PS1 in 1981. Um, and after that, it went into storage, Marin's personal storage in Baltimore. And it hadn't been out until Catherine and I kind of were like, oh, what's, <laughs> where's this beautiful piece? Um, and this piece was in We Wanted a Revolution. It traveled across the country um, and it now is in MoMA's permanent collection and it is on view at MoMA. Um, you can see it right now at MoMA and not to say that MoMA is kind of the be all end all, but I do say that for an artist who had been working for as many years as Marin had been um, in not in obscurity at all, you know, very well known to people who were paying attention, but not certainly not kind of reaping maybe the financial security that one might hope for in their 60s and 70s, um, that this is really meaningful, both from that logistical kind of brass tack standpoint, but also from the kind of, I've been doing this my whole life um, and it means something. Um, and to be paired here as she was with Sengen and Goody's incredible work, um, one, a really beautiful example of her pantyhose sculptures. Um, and they have been friends for, you know, half a century and collaborators, um, I think is extremely meaningful, but just like the really material shifts that can happen from a show like a historical show that really causes hopefully a wide scale kind of rethinking of a whole generation of artists. That was really the goal with We Wanted Revolution. Um, so big up Marin. It's really an amazing piece if you have a chance to see it. 
Um, we Wanted Revolution also included works by Emma Amos, these two paintings on the right that you're seeing, um, another painting on the left by Faith Ringgold. Um, it included a huge amount of ephemera, a lot of which is collected in the catalog. Um, and fundamentally, it was a show that was really interested in thinking about the kind of between the second wave feminist movement, which was primarily white, um, upper middle class, uh, college educated in the United States, and the Black Power movement, which was primarily male, um, and where kind of black black men, I should say, and where black women fit kind of, or didn't fit, you know, often this idea of kind of between a rock and a hard place. Um, and so it was a show that was really interested in pushing back against the idea that kind of black women either weren't there, that they weren't thinking about these issues, or that they were only there in some capacity as, you know, secretaries or scribes. But in fact, actually, they were really agents of change, um, both in terms of as art makers, um, in terms of as innovators, but also as organizers and creators of their own spaces and their own dialogues. Um, and so it was really important to us to include a mix of works of different media. So we have Jay Jarrell's incredible um, wearable suits in the foreground and in the back, a kind of print wall, including works by Elizabeth Catlett here and here, um, other artists um, like here, Emma Amos, uh, Barbara, Jones Hogu, uh, other artists like that. So it's really important to think through all these different ways in which women were kind of working and kind of working in collaboration as well. Um, Dinka McCannon, this is a work that actually came into the Brooklyn Museum's collection following the exhibition. So another example of the ways, and also the Brooklyn Museum just recently acquired another work of Dinka's I saw on Catherine's Instagram, which is exciting. Um, so again, this kind of way in which these shows can have a larger life, both outside of, you know, the curators and outside of even the audiences, but really have this ripple effect where we start to see, you know, real shifts um, in both art history and in um, people's lives. Uh, so this is an incredible work called Revolutionary Sister, in which Dinga was thinking about the Statue of Liberty um, and thinking specifically about the Statue of Liberty as this kind of beacon that wasn't really supposed to be necessarily for Black women, but this reclaiming of her, um, and also kind of this kind of militant idea. These are bullet casings. Um, they're actually kind of toy, toy bullet casings because she couldn't afford the real ones. Um, and the thing I love about this work actually is that it has a hinge right here. When we brought it into the museum and looked at it for conservation, we found out that this headpiece is actually unhinged. And the reason for that is because she needed to be able to transport it in her car. Um, and so she kind of created this logistical solution, quite elegant, um, that is both a formal solution in terms of it's her mouth, it cuts right across, but also speaks to the realities of she was transporting her own work. There were no art handlers. There was no kind of art shipping DIY operation, which she was able to achieve through the efforts of her own herself, but also of her community. Um, Dinga is a founder along with Faith Ringgold of a collective called Where We At, Black Women Artists. Um, and this is an incredible flyer from an exhibition that they had in 1972 called Cooking and Smoking. And you see these kind of incredible images of them. This is Dinga here with her child, here's Faith. Um, and one of the things that they really talked about is yes, kind of the cooperative aspect and like working together. So there was the kind of inclusion of her child is not an accident because many of them were mothers. And this idea that in the feminist movement at the time, there was kind of this idea of kind of separatism from men, which I think many black women felt like that just really doesn't work for us. Like we're fighting on multiple fronts. Racism is an issue. Sexism is an issue. How can we be separate from black, when, black men, excuse me, when black men are being, killed by the police when our children, you know, our sons will grow up to be black men, like that doesn't make any sense to us. Um, but there was also this idea that their identities included that, that motherhood, caretaking was a part of their work as an artist. It wasn't like a distraction or something separate, but of course it does require assistance. And so the collective efforts of where we at were, you know, giving critiques, uh, talking about each other's work, giving kind of ideas about where you might show your work, putting together exhibitions like this one, um, but also shared cooking, you know, potlucks, babysitting, um, all of these kinds of 
the big picture is kind of nitty gritty, big and small of what it takes and what it took, especially at this time to be an artist, um, especially a black woman um, and especially a parent. So this is where we at in 1980. Um, and I just, I love these photos. Uh, many of these women are no longer living, but some of them are and were able to be a part of the exhibition um, and to kind of have the, I hope really positive experience of seeing seeing their work be appreciated um, and seeing their innovation. You know, I think many of the ways that we think about mutual aid, especially in the last year, um, are not new. You know, these kind of ways of living in community, of kind of thinking about how we might kind of share our resources, um, whether they be financial, time, whatever we have, how we can share it collectively. Um, these are practices that were pioneered in many cases by Black women. Um, and not to say where we at invented it either. So it has a deeper history and I think it's important for us to see them and to acknowledge them. Here is Senga Nanguti with Inside Outside. Um, so many of the sculptures that, for example, the one that we saw in the MoMA image with Marin were made to be inter aspect that connects for me back to the work I did with Crossing Brooklyn. So rather than static sculptures that are meant to just be in the gallery, that is one way they live, um, but they also live um, not so much anymore because they're very fragile, um, but in their kind of intended moment as activated kind of objects to be used by a dancer or by the artist herself. Um, so as I mentioned, this show included a lot of ephemera. Um, and I just wanted to include this note from Len from Sangha Nanguti to Linda Good Bryant that was in the Just of Midtown Gallery's archives. Um, and she says, dear Linda, please send more business cards of the gallery. Also, please send any old nylons, pantyhose that you can get from anybody there. This will definitely help the cause. Hope all goes well, love Senga. Um, and on the other side, we have this Los Angeles Times article with notes by Marin Hassinger that she had sent to Linda saying, I resent being compared to Betty on the basis of race and sex. It's a way to keep us in our places. Um, so this, you know, there's always this kind of interesting, like, where are we allowed to be ourselves? So I love these archival documents, both because they speak to the really continuing this idea from where we are, this very quotidian, like, regular, like, can you send me some pantyhose, it'll really help the cause, but also a dialogue about criticism, about discourse, about the ways in which artists, specifically Black women artists, are being discussed um, in publications like the New York Times, um, and really saying, like, this isn't how I want to be talked about. This isn't how I see my work. Obviously, nothing wrong with Betty Sarr, deep love and respect, but we're not making the same work. It doesn't really have anything to do with each other. Um, and this is something I think we continue to see in 2021. So there you are. Appreciate, Marin. Um, finally, we have Faith Ringgold and Michelle Wallace, and our, who is her daughter. This is Faith here in this luxurious fur. Um, and this is Michelle holding 50% Black women artists. Um, they were a part of the Art Workers Coalition and other kind of protest and art activism movements of the time. Um, this is the Whitney, now the Frick currently, um, the, the Breuer building um, on the Upper East Side. Um, and so I, what I love about this photo is both that they're there obviously and the, the signs and, but also the kind of pure joy and the glee of it. They both have these incredible smiles. They're dressed really beautifully. And this idea that like, they're gonna go to a protest and they're gonna go downtown. Maybe they're gonna go shopping. Maybe they're gonna go out. You know, this is just part of their day. Um, and I think that that is a really important aspect as well. Like this wasn't something that like, you know, we pick up and put down. It was like, we do this for our life. Um, now on the left, we have another, another protest at the Whitney. There were many protests at the Whitney in the 1970s um, for a different reason. It was against an exhibition called Contemporary Black Artists in America. Um, Benny Andrews is the artist you see on the left. He says, no more Dodieism. Dodie is the curator that had been selected to work on this show. And one of the demands that was made by the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition um, of which Benny Andrews was a founder, was that black curator, a Black curator be appointed to work on this exhibition. Um, and that didn't happen. And the exhibition um, was protested. Several artists pulled out. Um, when I started at the Whitney, I was asked to work on this show, An Incomplete History of Protest, Selections from the Whitney's Collection. 
Um, and this was a really incredible project that I did with my colleagues, Jenny Goldstein and David Breslin, um, in which we were really able to look into the archives. Um, that's actually a lot of what you're seeing in these cases is archival material from the Whitney's actually very, uh, quite incredible archives of this period and you know all the way to the present. Um, and then the work that's on the wall here, of which here you can see a more clear version, um, is a piece by Faith Ringgold called Hate is a Sin Flag. Um, and in it, she tells the story um, of being in a protest at the Whitney um, and being called a racial slur and that it was the first time she'd been called a racial slur. Um, and so this is really interesting kind of connection to the institution. Um, but also for me having literally, I was working on We Wanted a Revolution. It hadn't even opened yet when I started working at the Whitney. I was kind of going back and forth between the two institutions. And I had been steeped in all this archival material in relation to We Wanted a Revolution and then came to the Whitney to kind of be steeped in a whole different but related archival um, <laughs> bonanza, frankly. Things that I wish that I had known existed so we could have put them in We Wanted a Revolution, honestly. Um, so I think that was a really interesting experience for me, um, both because it really deepened my knowledge of that period and of kind of the work that I've been doing, but also because it really deepened for me one of these kind of really bedrock ideas and feelings that I have about the relationship between art and politics, the relationship between art and protest, the relationship between, to go back to the Kambahi River Collective, one's own identity um, and the power of speaking from that place um, that we all have. So An Incomplete History of Protest um, was up for a year um, and it included many, many incredible artworks, but it included this work by Julie Moretu, which you may have seen recently if you saw the show, but you will see in this presentation as I power through it to get us to that part. Um, exhibition with Twain Ogio de Tola to Wander Determined, who's someone I had known for many years. I um, was really honored to be able to bring this show to the Whitney one of the things, or to, to work on the show with her at the Whitney, one of the things I really was excited about and remain excited about about the Whitney is the kind of nimbleness, the way in which we are able to kind of bring shows together quite quickly in comparison to other institutions um, and the commitment to working with younger artists, more emerging artists and um, people who have not had, this was Twain's kind of, this was her first New York Museum show. Um, and I think it really, did a lot for her and really propelled her forward in really important ways. Um, I just love these installation shots and I continue to think it was an incredibly beautiful show. Um, her work is of course incredibly beautiful, but I think this wall color, which was a huge <laughs> kerfuffle that we talked about for weeks, what color to choose, I feel we chose correctly. That's also part of the work. Um, after Twain's exhibition, um, I embarked on the biennial with my delightful, incredible co-curator, Jane Panetta. Um, and I cannot say enough about the virtues of collaboration and co-curatorial work, co-anything work. Um, I'm a deep, deep believer. Um, I've had, I don't think that I could have achieved at night at one tenth of the things that I have if I had always been working alone. Um, because two minds is better than one. Um, and this, the biennial is an experience that I think for me really defined that. Um, working with Jane was really an incredible joy and an honor. And I think we built a show that together was different than what we would have individually done and better actually. Um, so the biennial, I hope you saw it. We're not gonna go deeply into it, but we'll just look at some photos. Um, this is work by Kota Izawa painting by Jeanette Munt. Um, the painting back here is by Pat Phillips um, on the right side. Um, these are photographs <clears throat> by El Perez. Um, this is a piece by Jeff Gibson. Um, there were 75 artists in the exhibition. I had kind of forgotten that until Lori said it. And I actually kind of had a like, oh my God, what were we thinking? <laughs> um, well, it was a lot, it was a lot of artists. Um, this was one of my favorite rooms. You know, this is a very pixelated picture, I'm sorry. One of my favorite rooms um, in the galleries. One of the things that we really wanted to do and that was really important to us was to put artists into dialogue with one another. So rather than individual galleries, one artist, one gallery, we really wanted to think across purposes in some ways. Um, I think both of us, um, have really been trained in this idea of group thematic group exhibitions being the kind of gold standard for curatorial work. Um, and the 
you know, the ultimate. It's not a thematic exhibition in the same way as we wanted revolution, for example, um, but it is obviously a group exhibition. And I think the challenge that we set for ourselves was how do you create kind of almost a thematic exhibition for something like this that is inherently anti-theme, that is a survey. It happens every two years or every three years if there's a pandemic. Um, in this case. Um, and so we have here a painting by Geneva Ellis, sculptures by Simone Lee, um, paintings, um, excuse me, photographs on the back wall by Heji Shin. And I, this was just a room that I loved so much because I feel like it really exemplified this idea that we were really interested in thinking about artists who had very diverse practices, very different interests, very different ways of working and putting them together in ways that felt kind of formally interesting um, and aesthetically interesting, but also conceptually interesting. Obviously I'm biased, but I think, I think we did it in some places very well. Um, this is an image, not the best image, um, but I wanted to share um, that we also included, we thought a lot about performance um, in the relation to this biennial. So this is an incredible sculptural installation by Eric Mack on the left, paintings by Jennifer Packer on the right. Um, and the dancers that you see walking through in the black are dancers who were part of Brendan Fernandez. Brendan Fernandez's um, performance and his piece in the biennial. Um, so he had an installation that was at the back of the galleries behind these walls. Um, but dancers would activate it um, multiple times a week. Um, and they, of course, were incredibly stately and graceful and beautiful. But I also, it was, you know, a huge logistical challenge also to think about performance in relation to static exhibition um, and in relation to exhibition making. So that was a challenge that I don't think we quite realized how much of a challenge it would be until we were already doing it, thankfully, because I'm thrilled that we were able to do that with artists like Brendan and artists like Madeline Hollander. Um, and artists like Autumn Knight, many others. Um, this is work, <clears throat> excuse me, by Danielle Lind Ramos on the left and Eddie Arroyo, who you all may know from Miami on the right. Um, and I think another thing we were really interested in, um, Danielle is for, from Puerto Rico and we were really interested in thinking about not just expanding beyond New York, but I think really thinking through questions of America, foundational to the biennial, foundational to the institution, but also in our kind of particular time, thinking about Puerto Rico was really important to us and thinking about indigeneity was really important to us. Um, so I think there's always more and I think we could do more and everyone can continue to do more, but I do, it was really important to us to think about who is an American and who are the people kind of in our own institution historically, but also in our kind of art world. Um, and so we had some really incredible visits to Puerto Rico. Um, we had a great visit to Miami also, um, back when we used to do those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, I think it was really powerful. And Danielle is an incredible, incredible artist. Um, if you, I mean, they all are, but he is someone that I think what he was one among the older artists in the show um and i think has really just flourished had been flourishing as a professor at the university of puerto rico had been working for many decades um in the u.s um continental u.s as well as in puerto rico um but i think has really benefited from the shine of the biennial um and really continued to flourish and make really beautiful work Joe Minter in the center. Um, another thing we were really interested in thinking about is what are these kind of categories of art history that we are kind of accustomed to? We think about assemblage, we think about collage, we think about um, this kind of lineage that goes back to someone like Robert Rauschenberg. And I think we were really interested in positing this question of like, what if we think about someone like Joe Minter, um, Southern vernacular art um, kind of work specifically made by Black Southern folks is actually, this is our native, our work of our nation. Like this is what is kind of innate to us. Um, and so Joe Minter was somebody that was really important to us too because both his work is incredible, um, incredible, incredible, incredible artist. Um, if you have a chance to visit that, his African village um, in Birmingham, I please, please go. Um, but also somebody who I think who was kind of unexpectedly in dialogue with a lot of younger artists. So this is Troy Michi's work behind a much younger artist um, in this gallery, which you can't see. We had incredible sculptures by an artist called, named Brian Balot. Um, and I think there was a really, in a, you know, a contemporary New York 
maker, sculptor. Um, so I think there was a lot of really interesting synergies that even for us, not until we were installing were we like, oh shit, like something is happening here. Um, and I think that is one of the most incredible kind of gifts of this kind of work is that you plan and you plan and you think and you research and you make lists and you, you know, you do all the work and then you get into this kind of magical space of installation where you really have no idea what's going to happen on some level, even though of course you have a plan, you know, we had a floor plan um, that we'd spent months working on, um, but you still don't know how it's going to feel and things change. And so this was really one of those moments when we installed Joe Minter's work where I think we felt like this is really powerful to see his work here. Um, and another important aspect of the biennial to us was really thinking about a lot of the work did come into the Whitney's collection. Um, the biennial has traditionally been an important vehicle through which artists enter the Whitney's collection, especially younger artists. Um, in this case, Joe Minter is not a younger artist, but he had not been part of the Whitney's collection. And for me, he's kind of a quintessential American artist um, and the work um, and their area that he represents is quintessentially American. And so he deeply belongs at an institution like the Whitney. Um, so we were very lucky to be able to bring that work and some of this work into the collection so that when we think in the future about collection installations like an incomplete history protest, you know, 50 years from now when someone's doing their own who knows, whatever the topic is that now this person is in the collection and is a person who can be part of this narrative alongside someone like Rauschenberg. Um, this was Miriam Banani, um, her installation on the terrace. We also have these incredible outdoor spaces at the Whitney and really challenged ourselves to think about how we could make use of them. Um, Miriam really made these incredible like viewing stations for videos. So her videos are were on these monitors. There were a couple of these stations. Um, and so you would sit on these stair on these seats and kind of put your face up to the little the little peephole. Um, and watch the video that way. So also this kind of idea of video not being kind of a passive experience, sculpture not being a passive experience, but actually something that your body engages with and that the artist kind of is thinking about how your body can be a part of it. So this is something I think Miriam did so well. And then finally, we have made it to the present. I'm proud of myself. Um, Julie Moretu's mid-career survey that opened just a couple weeks ago at the Whitney. Um, and Julie is somebody, as I, we saw earlier, she connects back to the Studio Museum um, and she connects back to kind of this earliest stage of my career. Um, I didn't meet her during freestyle. I met her, you know, sometime in the 2000s, um, but I'm sure in the context of the Studio Museum, she's a New Yorker, she has, she lives in Harlem. Um, and so this show has been many years in the making. As Lori mentioned, it was at LACMA originally. It's a co-organization between the Whitney and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, and it has been delayed a year, um, but it opened at the high in between. Um, and after the Whitney, it will go on to the Walker in Minneapolis. So it is also having this really incredible kind of cross-continental experience. And there is a really beautiful catalog that we were able to do. Uh, for the opening at LACMA, which now seems like a lifetime ago. Um, so it's on the fifth floor of the Whitney's galleries, which now this is the third exhibition. Is that right? On the fifth floor, the biennial was on the fifth and the sixth floors. Another interesting aspect of being an institutional curator is that you use the same spaces for different shows um, over and over again. Um, and they shift um, and you do do some construction, but kind of, it's just always in the back of your mind, you're like, what did we do the last time? What did the other person do? It's always kind of the layers and the layers and the layers, which I think is really incredible. Um, this is only the third time since the Whitney reopened downtown that an entire floor has been given over to a living artist. Um, so this is a really incredible moment um, and a real honor for me, um, but I think also for Julie. Um, so the catalog includes what I call these kind of mind maps. Um, and I love to bring these into these conversations just because I think abstraction, sometimes people have this idea of it being kind of obtuse or kind of less accessible or less kind of political, less kind of having kind of less of a specific content. Um, and in Julie's case, none of those things are true and it could not be further from the truth. But also I think there's these really interesting reverberations as I was mentioning the kind of Venn diagrams, everything overlapping. So you see here, 
Julie has the cooking and smoking where are we at black women artist poster that I shared with you here she has um, images of protesters. This is at the Metropolitan Museum in 1969, but very related, the same organization, Black Emergency Cultural Coalition that protested at the Whitney um, with Benny Andrews, et cetera, in 71. We have just above Midtown Gallery um, advertisement in Art Forum um, founded by Linda Good Bryant, who I mentioned previously. We have the freestyle cover. This was the catalog. Um, and so I think there's all these interesting, we have the incredible David Hammond's um, body print um, and all these kind of different overlaps and over, overlaps that are important to me personally, but I think also kind of exhibit the ways in which there is this kind of cyclical, interesting nature to some of this work. Um, so this is me, Christine and Christine Y. Kim, who's my co-curator of the exhibition and Julie. Um, and this is Julie's studio. And this is a day that we were selecting drawings um, that would go into the exhibition. Um, and so I just also wanted to, to show Julie, to show Christine, um, to show us at work and really honor them both. Um, the show, as I said, the full fifth floor. And one of the things that we wanted to do was think about how to not have this kind of discrete periodization of like Julie's career, like 1996 to 2001 and like and contained and then 2001 to 2011 contained. The show does proceed chronologically and it does start in 1996, but we were really interested in what would happen if you kind of opened it up a little bit. So when you're looking here, you have um, and so, oh, can you hear me? Okay, good, sorry. Um, so you have these kind of moments where you have the past and the present kind of overlapping and much more in keeping with how artists actually work rather than this kind of discrete chunking that art history likes to do. Um, continuing, this is another Mogama painting. Now you're looking back. So here, this is 2012. Here, this is like 2005. Um, and now here again, we have this print that I showed previously that was in an incomplete history of protest. Um, it's called Epigraph Damascus. Um, and again, now here's the Mogamas, you're looking back at them and now you're in a gallery that's moving forward into the present, but you're still, again, always looking forward, always looking back. Um, this is of course my virtual background. Um, this is what we call the, the town square um, of the exhibition. It's kind of the center of the show, three panoramic paintings, all kind of monumental, really quite overwhelming in their scale, but also the idea that we had this huge space. This gallery is actually 60 feet wide, um, which sounds crazy and gave me like agita about like, is it gonna feel so empty? But actually it feels amazing. Um, and I think it really gives Julie the, the space um, that she deserves um, and the work really the space that it deserves for its kind of full absorption. The final thing that I wanted to share about the, the installation at the Whitney is that we were able to include a brand new painting, which I think is a very rare thing to do, um, especially these works take many years often to complete. Um, and Julie is someone who's kind of always working on multiple pieces at a time. She's not kind of start, finish one, start, finish the next. They're all at different stages. Um, so this work is called Ghost Him After the Raft and it's the dates are 2019 to 2021. Um, and the way that this came about is that she was had a painting, <laughs> you know, wasn't, wasn't necessarily working on it. And we started to talk about, wouldn't it be amazing to put something new in the Whitney's show. Um, and she really wanted to have the windows open. This is facing to the west, to the Hudson River. Um, but one of the logistical issues of having these windows open in any exhibition is the light. So you have to put up a wall to kind of protect the work on the other side. If you put up a wall, then like you just have this giant wall, no one wants to stare at a blank wall. What are you gonna put on the wall? So it's, it's like a whole thing. Um, and so we were like, well, Julie, if you make a painting and it's coming from your studio, the light levels, you know, it's okay. Like you'll get, you'll say it's okay um, in a way that an my, my sound. Can you guys? I'm just gonna talk really fast because I don't know. Um, and so this is a painting that she'd been working on, but started to really think about it as a site-specific painting. And so she finished it 
knowing it was going to be situated here, looking out on the river, um, that it was only going to be seen at the Whitney. It was not going to continue on to the other venue, the last venue of the tour. Um, and it, so it's really is thinking about the Statue of Liberty, which you can see when you look out these windows, look to the south. Um, it was really thinking about the Hudson River as kind of a thoroughfare, um, New York as a water, a city of waterways, which is part of what allowed it to become such an economic um, and global kind of superpower, but also what made it so appealing to the indigenous people that lived here prior to European contact. Um, and then also thinking about kind of waterways as spaces of migration. Um, and so these most recent works that Julie has been working on are often the kind of foundational layer is a photograph, um, you know, from the Associated Press or Reuters or similar news photograph. And in this case, it's photographs looking at photographs of anti-immigration protests in Europe, um, in Germany and the UK. So thinking specifically about this kind of moment of anti-immigration sentiment and the long history, of course, of that kind of anti-immigration sentiment in dialogue with the Statue of Liberty as this beacon of immigrants, um, this kind of gateway to America, New York's, I, I mean, excuse me, the United States ideology of itself as an immigrant nation, which is often at odds with our reality um, and our real rhetoric um, and our real treatment of immigrants historically to the very most present day. Um, and then finally, thinking about a painting from the 19th century by Theodore Jericho called The Raft of the Medusa, which is what the title after the raft alludes to. Um, and so this painting really like exemplifies all of these different threads that Julie pulls together um, so masterfully in her work. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to share because, you know, there are curators who never read reviews and I am not one of them. I've been given that advice and I just like can't do it. I don't have the, I don't have the fortitude um, for good or for bad, um, but I love this. I wanted to bring this into this, this presentation because first of all, here's this painting, which I just mentioned kind of on the front page of the Weekend Arts above the fold. And then here's this full spread, this incredible, installation image showing this kind of cross section of all the different these different eras of her work but also in relation to the review by David oops oops I'm really giving <clears throat> into a work uh, excuse me a review by, of an exhibition at the Drawing Center by David Hammonds. And again, we see this very same image that Julie's kind of mind map that I shared earlier. Um, and this is coincidence, but also there's no coincidences. Um, that is also an amazing show if you are in New York and are able to see it, um, highly recommend. Um, and I wanted to pull something just out of the review um, which I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you haven't, I would encourage you to read it. Um, but the last paragraph I will read, um, if the Whitney retrospective has one value above all, especially for young artists, it's Moretti's absolute refusal to accept a role so reduced. The new paintings reveal their workings more slowly than before. They're more haunted and far more difficult. Their mass overpowers all attempts to fix the artist's own position within some neo-colonial matrix. They demand attention to form and long minutes of looking. And even then, here's their pleasure and their political potency. They will not give up all their secrets. Um, and I don't want to end there just thinking about this in relation to these kind of words that I started with, with the Kambahi River Collective and kind of how an artist like Julie Muratu in the 21st century is kind of still advancing these ideas that were kind of given to us by earlier generations of Black artists, of Black women, of Black queer women. Um, and that is all. Thank you. And welcome, Esther. Thank you, Rue. Um, that was pretty insightful, super amazing. Um, selfish plug, I actually got to see the show in person at the Whitney uh, last week, right. I believe. Right. And I brought my um, teenage daughter who honestly hates everything because that's what you do when you're a teen. <laughs> and um, she actually took a couple photos of the Julie show, which is oh in God. her world. Like, that's like a cosign. Like, okay, this is legit. Like, this, these, these works Thank are you. actually speaking. So um, kudos to that. Me. That makes me feel really good. Kudos to um, the, Should I the... stop sharing? I'm not sure if I'm supposed it to stop matter. sharing right now. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Leave it? Okay, great. 
Okay, I'll go back to this this one. So we have something to look at. Yes. Um, go ahead. What were you gonna say, Esther? Yeah, no, I was just um saying how the show is just like amazing and just it when you walk in, you're kind of like swallowed. You know, you're just so like overwhelmed by just the grasp of it. And was that kind of the intent of just like when you walk in like these giant monolithic paintings and her name and all, it, it seems over, you know, it seems like just kind of like, well, her figure is great in the art world. She's such a great figure, but um, the show itself is just complimentary about her career. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it it definitely it's on one level it wasn't it was intentional, but on another level, it's like unavoidable mm. because you know we're talking about paintings that are five feet to twenty five feet, you know. So on some level, I think the idea of it being kind of all consuming and immersive is just like you can't really avoid it. So I think we definitely did kind of lean into that and really try to think about how to increase that experience in a positive way. Um, I think one of the things that's really challenging about Julie's work is the kind of relationship between kind of the micro and the macro. So like the desire to be very close to them, to see the details um, and to really get like absorbed in the details they also they often have like a lot of dimensionality and a lot of depth even though they're 2d 2d works um but then also that starts to feel really intense and overwhelming and you kind of want to step back um but how far do you go before you bump into another painting or right. you know how far do you go before now you can't really take it in you've gone too far and so i think we really tried to think about how to create maybe both of those experience or opportunities for both of those experiences. Yeah. Um, for those that are um, joining us live on Facebook, please put your questions in the chat. Um, we have a really impactful question by um, Prince Baruhi Thomas. Uh, he's representing Houston, Texas. Shout out to H-Town, Houston. Um, he asked, you spoke about gaps that occurred in your own educational background as an undergraduate. Looking back, do you think that was a structural problem within academia? And if so, how do we as a culture change that embedded bias within a system that is often resistant to change? Well, all right, then just like go right in. Uh, that is a really good question. And my short answer is yes, I do think that that is due to structural issues within academia. Um, not necessarily malicious. You know, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, yes, some people maybe think X, Y, Z about who's important and who's valuable and who's not. But I think more often than not, it's this idea of the accepted narratives, the accepted wisdom. Um, and art history, I think, has been very resistant um, and slow to change in comparison to some other kind of academic disciplines. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going in and out with the sound. Is it better? Yes, much better. Just like not gonna move. I'm not even touching anything. I don't know what's happening. This never happens. Um, I think one of the ways that we change it, I mean, that was a real overt goal with We Wanted a Revolution. That's why we did a catalog. Um, that's why we did two catalogs. That's why we made the catalog, the first catalog into like a course reader. It literally mm. mimics the kind of course book that, you know, I would have, you know, we'd have to buy for our, our art history classes with a selection of articles that this professor had chosen that were important, you know, addendum to our textbook or whatever. Um, and we, I was, we really thought very consciously about that format um, and that price point. That book is, I think, $22.95. Mm. Maybe it's twenty four ninety five. Mm -hmm. um, we, I wanted it to be under $25 because we wanted professors to put it on there Mm. reading lists. Mm -hmm. And we wanted it to be accessible to people in and outside of academia, you know, because I also think we learn in all sorts of spaces. Um, and I thought, think of that exhibition as really hopefully a teaching experience, whether you're an art history student, whether you're in college, whether you go to college ever or not. Um, but that is for me, that was one of the ways that we thought about it. Um, and, and I've had this really amazing experience 
now multiple times of people telling me, oh, like I took this class, you know, 20th century art history, you know, art history since 1970, like whatever it is, feminist art history, African-American art history, and your catalog was on my syllabus. Mm. Like we read, it was like one of the books we had to read. Um, so for me, that's been incredibly heartening because of exactly the kind of issue that you have raised and this question. Um, you know, I also think there are professors who've been doing this work for a very, very long time. Um, and there's also institutions that have been doing this work for a very, very long time. So, mm -hmm. you know, Howard University has had our art history department since the early 20th century, if not earlier. Um, there's been an ongoing incredible lecture series um, at Howard, specifically looking at art history. Um, and so, you know, there were gaps in my education but I also at some point became aware of those gaps. Um, and I don't think that the onus should always be on the student to kind of do that busy work. It's not busy work, but you know, to do that work of filling. But I also think that on some level, part of me feels a little bit like, okay, so y'all don't want to teach that. Like, I'm going to mm -hmm. go talk to people who are. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we lost you again. Can you say something? <laughs> oh, okay, we have you. Um, yeah, no, I mean, absolutely in regards to kind of the resistance oh, of change. No, oh. I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hold on. Can the audience hear me? <laughs> okay. Did that work? I can hear you. Can you hear me? No, I can't hear you. <clears throat> okay, oh. hold on. It's okay, you know, technical difficulties. It's 2021. Okay, wait, hold on, Esther. We're, we're trying one thing here. I don't okay. know what's happening. So they're saying that they could hear both Rue and myself, like but so Rue tragic. can't hear me. So <laughs> stand by, folks. Now we can't hear you. Maybe take off the headphones again because we can't hear you, Rue, back before we could hear you. Oh, Rue is connecting to audio. Wait, keep connecting to audio. Hello? Um. kidding.
Okay, I think we resolved the technical difficulties. I think so. Crossing fingers. Uh, okay, so <laughs> for those that are still on the Facebook Live chat, thank you. Um, I'm sure we have some diehard um, Rue fans out there. So I'm just going to reel through a couple of the questions that folks are eagerly asking for your thoughts. Um, we have Leah Laddie. She writes, hi, Rue. What advice would you give to a young emerging artist who is about to be in their last year of art school? Ooh. Well, congratulations, first of all. Um, you know, I think I would, I'm like so terrified the sound's gonna stop working, but I'm just not gonna focus on that. Um, you know, I think that the advice that I would give you is to really be in the moment, be in the present of that last year, um, because I think that school is, you know, it can be difficult. I think graduate school can be difficult um, for many reasons for many of us, but I also think it's such a unique and valuable space that really doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, you're kind of never going to have this like, oh, my job right now, even if you have another job, many other jobs to kind of pay for your life, um, pay for your yourself being in that space, but you're never going to have this kind of just unfettered space to just be in a studio. Even as a working artist, I think it becomes more complicated. Um, it becomes just the kind of logistical side of being an artist of, you know, you become a, you're a small business owner, actually, as an artist, you are the business. Um, and so I think I would really advise you to like, as much as you can, it's hard, of course, the future to really just like be in that moment and really get the most out of your peers, out of your professors, out of the resources that you have, um, whether that be the library, whether that be anything, whatever it is that you have, the ability to go to museums for free or reduced. Um, I just think that it's, it's I, I now looking back on my own graduate school experience, which I was like, couldn't wait to get out of <laughs> in right. some ways. Um, yeah, I wish that I had like not been so keen to get on to the next and been really kind of been in the moment a little bit more and been kind of present focused a little bit more. So, and then I would say uh, the same advice that I have for kind of all young artists, regardless, or maybe all artists, regardless of the stage that they're at is to like, look at art. You know, I think I was talking to Julie Maritou about this. Um, and she was talking about how so many of like younger artists that she talks to, you know, look at things on Instagram and look at things on screens. And obviously it's been a pandemic. So like, <laughs> don't endanger yourself to do that. Um, but that she was just like, yeah, I'm just always telling people like, you gotta just go look at stuff. You gotta go look at stuff. It's different, not just to appreciate what the artist's doing, but to like have the kind of physical experience between you and an art object um, whether that's a painting, a sculpture, a performance, an installation, whatever, you know, it, it, it pertains across media that like, it's kind of made to be a one, a relationship with, with a body, with, with a person. So go and like be that person. That's a really solid advice. Um, we have Cara to Spain. Um, shout out to Cara, a Miami based artist. She writes. Oh, hi, Kara. We've yeah, met. I know you. It's um, it's <laughs> nice to hear a curator talk about the challenges of life as an artist and sustainability, mind mapping, and finding folks in America that are outside of the coast. Can you say just a little about your personal approach in finding folks in such places? Uh, you know, trial and error. I don't think that there's not, there's not like an algorithm though, though the Instagram would have you believe differently maybe um, for how to do that. I think for the biennial, um, which is probably the exhibition I've worked on where that was most kind of overtly, you know, a really set out intention from the beginning, the way that we did that. And again, I will be the first to say that like, we could have done more. The show does still it skews very heavily in New York. Um, and I think the biennial often does for a host of reasons, um, some of which are that New York has a deep concentration of artists compared to other cities, some of which are that we are in New York, you know? Right. Um, and we're, you know, just hum human beings 
doing what we're trying to do. But I would say one of the ways that we really tried to work very actively to be very conscientious and conscious of that was, you know, we made our initial, like Jane and I both made our initial, like, oh, these are all these artists that I think are really great. And then we kind of started meeting with those people. Um, we also made lists of people. We had a, we'd had what we called like our listening tour where like every city that we went to, we would talk to kind of our peers in the field, whether that be curators and institutions, whether that be kind of people at independent art spaces, whether that be people working in programming in whatever city we went to, um, past biennial curators, um, really trying to expand the network beyond kind of our own network however vast your one's own network is it's always just it can always it's never as vast as two people's network or three people's or five people's so yeah and then we would ask those people in those cities like who are people that you are really excited about in your in your community in your creative community like who are people that we should talk to um and we we would ask artists too and I mean I think that can be sometimes a little bit like you don't want to ask an artist to recommend people and then be like, yeah, but not you. You know, I think it, there right. is like the the delicacy about people's people's feelings and people's hearts that I think is really important. Um, but we would ask artists, especially artists who maybe were professors or had you know taught lots of students or who had already been in the biennial because we also really wanted different biennials have done different things, but we really were felt really strongly about our biennial being artists who had not been um, in a biennial before, in a Whitney biennial, um, artists who had not had had not been in like a million other shows like this. Not that there's anything wrong with that, obviously, but we really wanted to use it as an opportunity to kind of give this platform to as many people who had not had it before as possible. Um, and so, yeah, we did it that way. Like I would say word of mouth, um, research, um, seeing shows, you know, Jane and I both, I think part of the reason that we were asked to be the curators is because we both had, you know, both an interest in historical exhibitions and thinking kind of historically, but also in contemporary art um, and in seeing shows and being in dialogue with kind of emerging artists um, and younger artist communities. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and I definitely, there's definitely artists that I'm like, oh man, like we you know, should have should have invited that person. You know, I think there's right. always at a certain point, you know, you have to stop inviting people because you have to make the show and because you're you know the colleagues all the other people at the museum who are so integral um to putting the show like that which is a huge undertaking the whole museum is involved sure. um in some capacity you know you have to like let them do their work and the more if you keep on adding people it's just like they can't you know mm -hmm. budget there's all these reasons why of course you just can't keep adding people um but it, that was like one of the hardest parts is to be like all right that's the last that's the last person. Right. I mean, you <laughs> must, you've must have done, I mean, zillions of studio visits, right? Just, you know, or we did artist meetings and we had so many. I mean, I think at some point yeah. I had all the stats like rattled off my head, but I think we did like almost, you know, over 300 studio visits. Wow. Um, and I mean, that's not including like, yeah, all the, all of our listening tour coffees and dinners and, you know, right. phone calls that we had with people, which were actually one of the, that was one of the best parts of the experience was getting to like know people in, you know, that we don't usually get to talk to across the country. And, you know, we had like meetings with folks in Miami and we had folk meetings with folks in Puerto Rico. We had meetings with folks in Houston, all over the country. And, you know, you get to cold call people, basically. It's the one time in your life when you're just like, hey, I don't know you. You seem cool. <laughs> Can we talk? <laughs> I'm a huge fan and it's not weird. Yeah, no, I think uh, it's like one of getting those calls from like the MacArthur, or one of those like, you know, like you just won a million dollars. You're like, yeah, let's talk, you know. Um, yeah, I'm so. sure it's a well welcome received cold call. For sure. Hopefully we try. We tried yeah. to take people out to, you know, nice lunches. Um, <laughs> Um, speaking of, so I had a personal question I wanted to ask you, you know, first things first, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. You know, we're hanging in. Yeah. In the panini, whatever yeah. you want to call it. We're still here. Thankfully, the, gratefully, mercifully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so obviously 2020 and the continuation of 2020, which is 2021, has been, you know, I don't want to even say all of the 
typical buzzwords, you know, unprecedented and, you know, special. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Special. Um, and just, it's extremely exhausting as you know, extremely you exhausting. as a mother, I'm sure you, that, that alone is exhausting. Yes. Has the past, I guess, 18 months, um, shifted your, your views on being a curator? Oh, damn. Well, okay. Um, you know, I, yes, yes, it has. I mean, I think the past 18 months have shifted my views on work in general. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, I read like an article or something the other day that was like, why are we so burnt out? And, you know, I am burnt out. I am, as I'm sure you are. And many of us are, um, even as I am very grateful to have a job um, sure. and to have a home and to be healthy. You know, it's like all of those things are simultaneously true. Um, but it was like the, whatever I was reading was like, we're so burnt out partially because when you take everything away except for work mm. and which is kind of what's happened like our social lives have kind of disappeared our family lives outside of you know our very immediate nuclear family or maybe if we're lucky enough to have family nearby to be able to like be in a pod with um our kind of travel life has disappeared our kind of be moving beyond the boundaries of our own mm. homes and maybe if maybe our own street has disappeared and it's obviously coming back in some ways but like when everything else has gone and you still have to work kind yeah. of in the same way and maybe more, you know, because the Zoom life, it proliferates. Sometimes I feel like I'm busier. Like I have more meetings mm -hmm. in a day than I would ever have had if, cause you would never schedule people's calendars like with five meetings, physical in-person meetings back to back, right. but you Zoom, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I think that is a, that applies to many people. So yeah, I think the past 18 months have really changed how I think about work and how I think about its relationship to, to my family, to my daughter. Yeah, she's two. So half her life has been the pandemic and God bless her, you know, her utero life was planning the biennial um, and her post very immediately post birth life was the biennial opening. Um, so, you know, she's, she's going to have an interesting, yeah, 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 for she's sure. a, a trooper. Um, and also, you know, a great light in this year, like, yeah. you know, so I can't, it's again, it's always both and all the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think how we spend our time and what we spend our time doing feels so, and it's unresolved. Like, I'm not like, oh, and now exactly, I do only what I want exactly when I want far from mm -hmm. it, but you know, it's like, I think about it a little bit differently. Um, and when I think about returning to work um, in a non-remote way, you know, I'm much more committed to thinking about how do we create work-life balance for people? Like, especially, you know, having had a baby during the biennial, been very stressed about when to go back and not wanting to miss out and not wanting people to think I'm like, <laughs> God forbid, like, postpartum, like, you know, really trying to like, I'm doing it all. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, you know, and I think nobody put that pressure on me except for me, you know, mm. except for, okay, great. Yes. Society, the whole world, everybody, but no individual was like, tisk tisk. what are you doing? Right. Um, so yeah, I think I'm really interested in thinking about how do we go back to work? Um, how do we go back to our lives in a way that allows us to be our full selves, um, right. and allows us to say no to things um, and to only say like emphatic yeses to things, um, yeah. to only do things that we emphatically feel so excited about because at the end of the day, it's like time away from my family. It's time away from myself. It's time away, you know, from, yeah, like what is, what are you, we even doing, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's just so many levels to it too. And I'm just curious as well, um, if you have this kind of like weighted pressure, right? Particularly with the current climate, mm -hmm. um, you know, with Black Lives Matter and, you know, with Stop Asian Hate and all of mm -hmm. these things that like as somebody of your, you know, figure in the art world, which is, let's be honest, is a pretty damn white male art world. Mm -hmm. Do you get the sense of like, holy shit, not only am I <laughs> of color, I'm a woman, I'm a mother. I mean, there's so many levels to it. And it's like, all eyes are on Rue, right? They're just kind of like, uh -oh. 
What is she doing next? What's going on? What is she going to say? What in, you know, zooming. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think about it that way because I think if I thought about it that way, I would be very overwhelmed and like, wouldn't like be able to do anything, um, frankly, but you know, I think we are in a moment, but I think there are many of us. Um, and that's also kind of what I, you know, I always go back to thinking about the kind of trajectory of my career and the work that I've done and the mentors I've had and the work I've been, you know, called to do is that like that I've never not known that this is, that that these are the things that matter. I've never been like, oh, pure art connoisseurship or pure art history separate from the world. Like that has always been like anathema to me. You know, the reason that I became an art history major in college was because I took a class with a professor at Barnard named Elizabeth Hutchinson, who taught a class on American art. You know, it was like the colonial period, not contemporary, like they had ended in 1900 or something. Um, But she taught that class kind of from pre-revolutionary war to 1900, thinking about indigenous people, thinking about Mm. slavery, thinking about uh, manifest destiny, thinking about, you know, all of this was incorporated into our class and it, because it belongs. Like, how do you talk about Mm. the Hudson River School without talking about manifest destiny, without talking about the genocide of native people? Like, how do you talk about so many things that are like innate to American art? in its early, you know, how do you talk about colonial portraiture without talking about the very few kind of black artists? Um, How do you talk, you know, there's just, who were among kind of the best, most, you know, most pursued portraitists. How do you not talk about this person's race and what their experience was as an artist in a totally kind of racist society in which they actually were successful and renowned and appreciated, you know? So it's like, that was the moment that I was like, oh, like I can be an art history major. Cause before I was like, well, I like it, but mm. I don't know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. So I guess I get, I feel like for me, the way in which the shows that I've done my whole career, the work that I've done, the way that I've framed my, my work, the way that I've positioned my, the things that I have said about why I do this work and what it's important for and the artists that I've been interested in they have all been having this conversation the whole time. And, you know, I mentioned Howard University, HBCUs in general have been doing this work, not just in art history, but in terms of kind of activism, social justice, politics, you know, been doing this work for many years. Um, So, you know, I think like, we're not, (laughs) we're not brand new, nothing, you know, I'm not brand new. Like I am very much a product of, many people, many generations, you know, many who've come before us, which is true of all of us. And so I think that's how I prefer to feel and think of myself as part of a lineage rather than, and I, and, you know, other people may see kind of more, may do, may think differently, but like the way I think about what I do and why I do it and why I keep doing it, even when, yes, it can be overwhelming (laughs) the realities of our field, but actually the realities of our world, which our field replicates you know, we are part of the world, we're not separate from it. So of course we reproduce some of the same issues, some of the same, um, you know, inefficiencies, inadequacies, um, downright over, you know. Yeah, I think also part of being a curator is you're almost like a revisionist historian, right? You're like retelling the story that was silenced in some way. Well, and I think that is one way of looking at it. And I think that's more and more a kind of, way that people are thinking about the work that we do, but I don't think it always was, you know, and I mm. think Catherine Morris, who is my, was my co-curator for We Own a Revolution, but is the curator of the Elizabeth Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum, and is the co-curator of the amazing Lorraine O'Grady show that's up right now, if anybody mm. hasn't seen that. It's very good. Lorraine is the best. Um, but Catherine talked a lot about how kind of revisionist art history started within kind of like the feminist art historians were among the kind of first to use that approach um and that feminist historians in general kind of were the ones who started really thinking about revisionism of looking at the past and now that is that's such an important way that curatorial work um, and art history specifically happens you know and so Mm -hmm. i think yeah that is a really you know when we think about the gaps when we think about kind of 
pulling things kind of forward. You know, I'm also really now invested as I talked about acquisitions in terms of the biennial mm-hmm. and doing a show like Julie's um, at the Whitney and having it take up the full fifth floor and having it have this beautiful catalog and having it have all of this kind of, all of this kind of heft that it deserves is that that now means that this, this gap that may have existed in the about kind of 20th century, 21st century painting abstraction in American art history in the 20th and 21st centuries means that someone like Julie is now a part of it because you can't mm. ignore a giant show on the fifth floor of the Whitney in 2021 um, and the painting that was brought into the collection in relation to the show. So, you know, a hundred years from now, someone's doing yep. their 21st century art history survey. The painting is there. Yeah. That's they may powerful. not include it. We don't know what's going to happen. None of us will be here, but like, I think that it's like both the kind of retroactive kind of gap filling, but also the mm. like future thinking about what can we do? You know, it's like this weird time travel, like, because yeah. I think that's one of the things I really like about being an institutional curator with a collect at a collecting institution is that you're kind of part of this historical continuum in this really interesting way, making yeah. decisions yeah. that you'll never see, you know, what people do with them. But maybe people will be like, wow, those people were crazy. Probably. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Especially this year and last well, year, they're going to look back and be like, um, they better be yeah. like, they did the best that they could because it was hard. <laughs> Girl, we are trying. <laughs> we um, really hard. We're trying really hard. I, we're, of course, super out of time, but I do want to ask one last question. Um, and I, I kind of was teasing you about it on the Instagram, but um, what is giving you comfort these days? You know, in such a crazy time, mm-hmm. um, do you stress eat? Like, do you have a go-to? I mean, you know, usually I only have one (laughs) beverage right now in my Zoom, only one glass of water. So people don't think that I'm crazy, but usually in my, my daytime Zooms at work, I have like a nice coffee and a smoothie and a water. (laughs) And then I go and get another, like, I have like six drinks. I don't know what that's about. I think that's like a category category of Zoom user. Um, but yeah, you know, I think like there was like, I definitely have been through the phases. There was like a very intense TV watching era of the pandemic that kind of had to like, you know, at a certain point you're just like, now I just stay up super late every night and I still have to get up and like have it. My child still wakes up at the same time every day. And like, why did I stay up so late watching like Bridgerton, even though Bridgerton was amazing. Um, or whatever it is, you know, you so that was a moment, you know, I'm trying to like get back into like some sort of reading. Like, I feel like mm-hmm. I've always been a big reader, love fiction, love novels my whole life. And I probably read two books, the entire T oh. of the pandemic year, which like, it's not a contest, but like, I like, that is crazy for me. Um, so I'm trying, and I think it's just like, I couldn't, my brain could not like focus. Right. Well, like, yeah. I couldn't finish for fair reason anything yeah. Yeah. yeah so I'm trying and that's always been something that has like brought me comfort and brought me joy and like you know I love fiction for it's like escapist qualities but also right. it's kind of grounding qualities and like other people's stories and putting yourselves in another putting yourself in another setting in another situation um stress eating I mean I have snacking <laughs> so much snacking so much I mean I feel like you just are like home and you go downstairs and you snack and you like bring your little snacks to your table and random things eat all sorts of random things um yeah I don't know and you know I have to say like it is insane to have a toddler period they're crazy they're Um, crazy they're crazy like drunk little people they're and they're crazy. like, just like, just have no sense of their own, you know, mortality or vulnerability, it's amazing. but also yeah. are like, I'm so happy. I'm so mad. I'm so sad. Oh, look, speaking of, do you want to come see Hi. Esther? Hi. <coughs> we have a visitor. She's being shy, I think. Oh, you want to see Esther, Nancy? You just watch her from the door? All it's right. okay. You're still doing your talk. I am still doing my talk. Is that we're just, we're happening? just, you know. <laughs> Esther and I are chatting. We're doing the Q and A portion. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that is. Mommy. Oh, mommy. Oh, hi. Hi. The best is, part of this entire yeah. presentation just took place now. Daddy, daddy. Yes, daddy's oh. here too. 
Um, yes, well, this is apropos because, you know, maniac, though these small people are, it's like the great best. joy, great joy, you know, great happiness, great hilarity. Mm-hmm. You know, she's got jokes, she's got dance moves. And this is why this is why we're doing it right yeah yeah so you know i think i have to say even though it's been crazy to have a child and a small child during this year it's also been a you know a great blessing to have her and to be able to spend time as a family you know like let's be real we just traveled a lot we didn't like hang out as much as we might want to before we hang out all the time now yeah no it's great well, thank you so much. Also, I want to give a big shout out to Hank. I'm wearing my um, Mel Chen Black Lives oh, Matter. Yeah. He's right here. He said Uncle Mel. Uncle Mel represent yes. Four represent Freedoms. Houston, H-Town, Mel yep. Chen, we love you. So, Four Freedoms, um, we love you. Thank you, Rue. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Not thank you, Zoom, for that no, weird technical Not difficulty. thank you, Zoom, for that weird te- no. But I think it was honestly my computer. So don't, I mean, sorry, okay, don't, well, let's not besmirch right. Zoom, but we can blame Zoom. Okay. But, um, and thank you, of course, Denise and Andrew, behind the scenes tech goddess and gods. They're the best. All right. Can you wave hi? Bye. Can you Does say bye? Can you wave bye bye? Bye. Can you wave bye. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Okay.